Hi all, our notable game today is for our Evolution of Chess Style series on the channel, which I would like to progress quite significantly this year. Let's take a look at the FIDE World Championship Tournament of 1948. So to recap here, uh, Alekhine had died on 23rd of March 1946, two years earlier. Uh, this information is from Chess Gamescom. At the July 1946 Winterfell Congress, FIDE proposed the contest for the vacant title to be scheduled June 1947 in the Netherlands. So they planned a quadruple round robin tournament featuring Samuel Rzhevsky, Ruben Fine, Mikhail Botvinnik, Paul Kares, Vasily Smyslov, and the winner of either the upcoming Groningen or the Prague tournaments decided by match if necessary. Max Owe was also included because he had previously held the world title. The tournament was delayed partly because the USSR was not yet a FIDE member. On 15th of September 1946, the proposed contestants except Ruben Fine met in Moscow to iron out the details. Uh, the meeting occurred a day after the USSR-USA match ended and did not involve FIDE. Botvinnik reportedly announced that he would not play in the Netherlands. He was angry about a Dutch news report that suggested his fellow Russians might collude to help him win the title. The five uh, contestants then compromised with a plan to divide the event between the Netherlands and Moscow. The Soviet Sports Committee refused this idea outright because they wanted all the games to be played in Moscow. Meanwhile, the FIDE president, Alexander Rube, withdrew FIDE's claim to organise the tournament. Uh, so, nothing concrete was decided until the next FIDE Congress in August 1947. So they had new conditions and they, they said the tournament would begin in spring 1948, being partly played in The Hague and partly in Moscow. And most notably, no extra player would be added. Miguel Nydorf was excluded because of this change. He won the Prague 1946 and would have qualified directly for the Championship Tournament since Botvinnik had won Groningen 1946 and was already seeded in the championship. Shortly before the tournament, Fine also dropped out due to ac academic uh, commitments. So Fido there, therefore decided to stage a quintuple round robin. So that's four times each player to play each other for a total of 25 rounds, with one player having a buy each round. Time control, 40 moves in two and a half hours, then 16 moves per hour after that. There were prizes not as significant as in the Fisher era. era. First prize was $5,000, second $3,000, third $2,000, fourth $1,500, fifth $1,000. Okay, now this game I'd like to show you from this tournament, so the side of the world champion, I've already shown you in this in the style series, actually, there, there was a fast forward to one of the other games uh, where Mikhail Botvinnik had played Kaz. And... Um, there's some arguments actually that maybe there had been some sort of subtle pressure for Kares not to necessarily beat Mikhail Popovic in each game, um, uh, and um, Popovic said in 1948 I played well. I, pla I prepared with all my heart and showed what I was capable of. Here he's playing against Max Erwer. That's the game I want to show you. So a former world chess champion who had actually beaten Alexander Alekhine. And Alekhine had, of course, wrestled the title back from Max Erwe. But here, Mikhail Botvinnik against Erwe. D4, D5, C4, E6. We see, actually, a Slav defense emerge after E3, Knight BD7. Bishop D3, you might think it's logical for black just to simply develop the bishop to D6. This is actually one of the more popular moves here, the second most popular. The most popular is D takes, and then committing the, the queenside bishop, and then playing like this, leaving this bishop at home quite significantly for some time. This is a very popular line. But uh, in this game... Um, Instead of d takes, and instead of bishop d6, which you might think is also quite logical, we see bishop b4, and it looks a little bit like a cross between a Nimzo engine and a Slav defense. You might think, what is going on? 
Um, I remember seeing a game like this at the London Chess Classic a couple of years back. I thought it's quite novel. Is the bishop like rerouting like this? Of course, c6 affords this cute rerouting maneuver. But what does white? Uh, sorry, what does black actually gain by doing this? Is black really wanting just to create very subtle queenside weaknesses? Isn't this space advantage useful for something? The thing is about this position, white did play a3 and has of course the option of b4 later but usually if c5 is played that e5 will come with greater effect e5 e4 because it actually strengthens if white ever plays c5 it's actually strengthening d5 in a way there's less tension in the center so it's an invitation for queen side expansion but whether white really wants to follow up on this invitation is another matter Mikhail Botvinnik plays queen c2 for a moment in this position popular is also castles and there's one game with b4 as well immediately in live book queen e7 and white refuses again actually to play b4 here maybe many of us would be tempted with b4 but what does it actually achieve the bishop's just rerouting here on a potentially dangerous diagonal if white ever castles and then if c5 that just compounds things for e5 later e4 so bishop d2 actually is played uh, keeping the tension going here and now we see d takes c4 from black bishop takes c4 and an immediate e5 now both sides castle and again white is not tempted for b4 well he's not really trying to get a queen side space advantage here he actually plays rook a e1 which looks like an invitation to black to stretch out with e4. I'm not sure it is wise for black to do that in this position, although it look might look a little bit tempting and it's technically possible. The pawn would surely be quite weak. Black played bishop c7 instead. Let's have a quick look. In this position, actually, it's a trap, actually, tactically. This is a loose piece here. Which is another argument for bishop d2 there's actually can you see what white can do here i originally thought it might be knight g5 but there's actually something more concrete white can do in this position if i give you five seconds can you see what white can do five seconds pull the video starting from now yep knight takes e4 actually hitting the bishop here so if takes here we can take like this or even with this knight yeah, queen takes take here and take the bishop so yeah black cannot step forward with e4 uh, he plays bishop c7 and yes it's it seems in principle kind of thematic black play max Erwas play it seems thematic and kind of cute in a way this this bishop zigzagging to an important attacking diagonal what does white want to do in this position White plays knight e4 and actually introduces immediately a tactical concrete threat, bishop b4, skewering the queen and rook. So it doesn't seem to be a move played on that much general grounds, just it's creating a major tactical threat. Uh, black addresses it with knight takes e4. We have queen takes e4. And now a move like knight f6, I think queen h4 looks like a very nice parking move for the queen parking spot for the queen if nothing else uh so it's kind of a nuisance actually the queen on e4 here black plays a5 and then we have bishop a2 as if maybe bishop b1 is also on the cards at some point but now we do get knight f6 with this nice parking spot queen h4 yeah so white seems to have here a very nice attacking position potentially threatening now d takes e5 and just grabbing the bishop pair from black and following up bishop c3 and both these bishops on the diagonals look pretty pretty dangerous we have e4 now being played and it looks to embarrass the knight surely the knight actually can't go back hasn't white done himself in he's done no favors well there's a clever point here that Michael Bobbin must have had in, in mind for all this this configuration 
it wasn't just the set traps with bishop b4 etc which blocked in the knight basically um white has an important idea here he plays knight e5 it's a pawn sacrifice a positional pawn sacrifice it does crank up the pressure as many positional pawn, positional sacrifices in general do for the for the bishop pair for white's bishop pair bishop takes e5 is played if it's not this is an interesting question can a light actually be left there maybe it's just going to be supported with bishop c3 if it's left there and then maybe even f4 later uh, we have bishop takes e5 black taking up the gambit so essentially a gambit position bishop c3 but look at the compensation white has the queen is an ideal attacking parking spot here on h4 pinning the knight kind of putting pressure on h7 and the rooks also they're more connected at the moment and they've got this lever pawn which they utilize now f3 it's a very dangerous position for black indeed extreme accuracy in fact i believe is needed here for black to survive the engine suggestion looks terrifying for black but maybe it's necessary e takes is the engine suggestion is one of them knight d5 was played in the game let's have a quick, quick look e takes bishop b1 fresting bishop takes f6 as an idea this position looks scary but maybe it's actually necessary for black because if black's not getting mated this might be the way to go believe it or not uh, to reach a, a safe position ultimately to reach a safe position but um, no we see this knight d5 and this leaves a nagging pressure and advantage for white here after quit the queens come off and although the pawns look a little bit ugly on the surface they're controlling key squares and another significant thing about this is the f7 pressure and white is quick to the default why is this position so dangerous black played b6 here is it really so bad for black this particular position let's just check something here what i would propose to check out is bishop e6 i think white can just take this yes and is quick to the default and then if something like this white can forcibly get down that default like this infiltrating and this is just unpleasant of course or winning for white basically this so this bishop e6 it seems as though yeah defiles a problem if here this pawn drops actually technically for a start this is good for white yeah it's difficult to it seems neutralize uh the pressure in this particular position it does seem it's a definite advantage for white basically this position here so even though the pawns look a bit weird it's it's the peace power here it's quite high and Bobnik is often doing that he's often getting some some sort of ugly pawn structure but he's got good peace power rook d1 and now this carries a threat of rook takes f7 and rook d8 because that rook will be pins and it'll be checkmate there uh, so black has to defend against that and he can't do bishop b7 rook d7 of course um and he plays actually black plays knight g6 which seems to invite a rook infiltration you might think bishop a6 is that possible let's just check this one out bishop a6 probably strong here is rook f2 actually giving white chance to conquer the default white's conquering the default here whatever happens or rook d7 this is strong for white Rook eight, then we actually can take here and then take here that's no good with the rook yeah so the pr the pressure is evident both on the d and f files so although you know black's moves look passive it seems as though it's difficult to advise black to how to release the pressure we have rook d6 here hitting the c6 pawn now attacking on both sides of the board bishop a6 rook f2 so that does leave the option of default control as well as keeping the pressure on f7 black protects the c6 pawn and now we have e5 which 
is mounting the pressure really there'll be rook d7 potentially now coming up uh as well as e6 potentially on the cards we have knight e7 is the knight going to get a square like d5 maybe to the pawn set not really it's, it's ruled out the knight is um, restricted a bit more c5 at least covering the d7 square but now e6 this is really getting nasty now on this diagonal f6 yeah blacks also losing this pawn here what was the clever idea why didn't white just play rook takes b6 this is possible this is possible here it's not a big deal this is still an advantage for white um but yeah e6 is good as well now after f6 we have white do white does take the pawn dismantling black it's it's gone horribly wrong this whole game really after bishop c6 here can you see what white plays now it's a strong very strong forcing move continuation if i give you five seconds to pause the video here what would you play with white very very powerful continuation so five seconds starting from now okay rook takes c6 yep opening up this diagonal e7 check forcing rook f7 now awkward pin um, white now plays a crushing king's crushing move <laughs> well not particularly king's crushing actually it's more materialistic um can you see what white can play in this position if i give you five seconds the last move of the game what would you play here with white are you content with one point pin or trying to exploit that pin would you take the rook is there something stronger pin and win is often a, a real really useful motto in chess or the pin is mightier than the sword <laughs> but here what does white play okay a powerful centralizing move as well bishop d5 black's helpless this rook's helpless the king's helpless can't even move to f8 by the way and the rook's pretty helpless because actually it's got a guard against e8 so it can't even do this because we could just take on c6 just be winning material We're up material hugely up material this is just hopeless uh just just to convince you i mean i'll show a variation or two this this one apparently even stronger than this technically is is um this one now to take on c6 hitting the rook and the point is actually it's all with tempo isn't it so if this rooks <laughs> moves okay we've got another move here we win the exchange or or the other way we just win the exchange again we're winning the exchange with bishop d5 or we can just even take this pawn this is a big advantage just taking this pawn as well but bishop d5 yeah it's all over white's just basically going to be a bishop up this is a very powerful display by Mikhail Botvinnik against Max Erwa, who, by the way, later became the FIDE, uh, FIDE president for a number of years and helped to integrate, really, I, I, I believe, the USSR with uh, FIDE. Um, so this, this tournament, actually, Mikhail Botvinnik only suffered two defeats. And, yeah, there's some controversy over the games with, with, with Kares. Um, some charged that the Soviets... They, they pressurized Kaz to throw games to help Botvinnik win. According to Kenneth Wilde, Kaz told him he was not ordered to lose games to Botvinnik and was not playing to lose, but he'd be given the, been given a broader instruction that if Botvinnik had failed to become world champion, it must not be the fault of Kaz. So, yeah, I know this is not a game of Kaz, and we've covered a game of Kaz in the Evolution of Style series. And I, I want to emphasize something. How do we concretely measure? the evolution of style are we really saying that Mikhail Vopnik is stronger than either Max Ower or or the deceased Alekhine at this stage Alekhine was Alekhine he was his own personality he had a massive love of the game Kasparov used to go through Alekhine games I think a lot of dynamic aggressive players have gone thoroughly through Alekhine games massive creative flights of fantasy sometimes brilliant combinations pawn sacrifices in the opening a lot about the initiative 
power of combination the power of pieces Mikhail Botvinnik of course is a next generation player from either Alexander Alakine or Max Ower okay here he, he flashed Ower but Ower was getting on a bit what we do have <clears throat> concretely I believe in our evolution of chess style is an increasing database of games as well as the technological context for chess evolving all the time they didn't have internet back then they couldn't share games immediately they didn't have massive databases but through history we collect games and we know the exceptions the rules more and more so we, we're playing positions maybe we wouldn't have before things come into fashion out of fashion but we stand on the heads and shoulders of the previous generations is there evolution or just increments in knowledge and the technological and the communication context around chess uh, but yeah Mikhail Botvinnik demonstrated in this game you know that's he, he could thrash Max over sure but you know there's an age difference as well so is that evolution or just the younger generation coming through but for sure you know Mikhail Botvinnik extended the game and we're going to see now in the next few videos I'd like to look at his world championship match against David Bronstein who is also a fantastically creative original player and thinker so I think this is our going to be a last visit for a while of this 1948 tournament actually we'll just go on to the Botvinnik Bronstein match in the subsequent videos for the moment okay comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much